for the technology so. there. Most of my poems have kind of a, a, a more serious or, or mental health bent, but the first one I thought I would try is supposed to have a little more humor in it. So we're going to start with um, Big Men's Knees. I know a lot of guys who are um, tall and heavy set, so that's what this is coming from. Big guys relish how much they can eat, how many beers they can drink, brag about, about the amounts they can lift, carry, move when they are young, believe they are invincible. Some are given nicknames like Tank and Moose, do their best to live up to those monikers. They recognize value in exercise, even encourage others to engage in that vile practice. They buy big men's clothes, first class plane seats, recliners for working other furniture, old Cadillacs or oversized pickups to accommodate their bulk. They avoid fragile looking chairs in other people's homes. Growing ever bigger, they limp or hobble a bit in their 40s limit walking and attend only events that accommodate pickup traffic door to door. Each stone of weight gain pressures heart and frame. Doctors recommend new knees by 55. Only then these guys begin to consider losing weight, but they can't exercise. Too much pressure on those knees. <laughs> <laughs> Test? Is that oh, there we go. <laughs> okay. A few years ago, uh, a few years ago, the um, foundation office here on campus had a statue by Herb Minery uh, called uh, Reply Requested. And Herb Minery, as you may know or may not know, is the sculptor who did the statue in front of the library with the bench. And he has many, many uh, pieces of art scattered all over the place. But I just fell in love with this one. But it, my pocketbook couldn't quite get there. Um, she waited patiently some days. Other times she paced back and forth with the baby in her arms, eyes continually darting to the window, peering out to search the horizon for a possible visitor, a neighbor passing on the trip to town, or better, on the way home, as there may have been a package or letter sent her way. She wrote to several relatives in Philadelphia last month to her mother in Syracuse a week after that, and to an old friend recently moved to Chicago with a new husband, closing each missive with reply requested. She wrote a letter to the editor of the Denver Post about the shocking cost of sugar and flour. She inwardly fumed that her correspondents didn't appreciate how anxiously she awaited their response, perhaps not realizing how far she lived from any town, how seldom she was able to leave home, three children under five requiring all her time, husband gone days and many nights cowboying from the big ranch down the road. She reached out to absently pet the dog, thought about the last time she read a newspaper, tried to recall the last time all three children were asleep. Chores done and it was light enough to read the Bible or one of the books she kept hidden from little boy's boisterous play, her daughter's tiny fingers. She found time to write a quick note to her sister in Omaha about the tiny red flowers just now blooming near the barn. She wrote about the baby's first step, her, son, her oldest son's attempt to climb the hayloft ladder, his fall how thankful she was that she did not break any bones. End of the missive, reply requested. Sent the message with her neighbor, kind enough to stop for mail on his trip to town. That was kind of an 18, late 1800s kind of um, time setting, and this one, the next one is also. 
It's called Horse Thief. And this comes from, um, I saw uh, the Omaha World Herald, I don't know if anybody's a paper reader around here, but they, I, I, once in a while they have little blurbs with um, historical notes. And so there's this little paragraph. So this one's called Horse Thief. They moved to a hard scrabble Kepaha County ranch with five kids. She raised them alone in a two room tar paper tenant shack, prairie wind howling through the walls after he froze to death cowboying in the blizzard of 88. Kids left Sand Hill Country at an early age, made their way in life. Oldest daughter married young, moved away. Two sons next in line hired out to wrangle cows. A fourth died of a fever. And the last named Bert saw the lay of the land, headed out to find another way to get by. Bert was a natural born writer, a wonderkin, who tamed any mount for pay but quit working, took up horse thieving as more profitable and fun, courted a reputation thereabouts for borrowing animals, caught and convicted as a horse thief by age 19, served time in the Nebraska State Pen beginning in 01, checked in to serve the sentence at 5 feet 8 inches tall, 140 pounds. Bert claimed to be a married man worked in the prison broom factory, performed duties well, according to prison records. It's uncertain how Bert's condition, condition was hidden, unclear how the guards failed to notice through admitting bath, physical exam, living with hardened men for 11 long months, that Bert was really a young lady named Lena. The prison doctor confirmed the story that Bert, nay Lena, was a she, her gender revealed after she spurned her cellmate's advances. Amused at the fuss, Lena requested a dress to replace her suit of stripes for the move to the women's reformatory. Governor Savage heard the story, pardoned Lena on condition, she reform her ways, return to Springfield, live with her mother for the rest of her days. <laughs> search the sky for the fowl we hear honking around us. Heavens filled with birds wheeling, careening, bee forming, reforming, sighting this fertile ground. Cornfields draw, seduce, pulling great shapes closer, visible at twilight, the birds take form. The flocks, talks, guiding, cajoling, singing, bringing the crew in for a night landing. Protected on the edge of the River Platte, the fields are a refuge, refueling station before the long trip north. This visit to my grown son concludes a respite from my solo journey. Now I must turn my face, like the geese, toward a new horizon. part of Wayne County and there's a lot of, uh, when I first moved out there some 30 some years ago, it's hard to believe that much time has passed, but anyway, there were lots of um, older homes and semi-abandoned homes there. Um, and over the years these have slowly disappeared. Um, so some of the next few poems are gonna kind of address that notion. This one's called Tire Swing. Long after the house vanished, the tire hangs alone, sentinel on a now abandoned homestead. The late afternoon winter light reflects the ball tire, weathered to gray after years of hanging from the old cottonwood. The wind through the trees sounds like children calling. Their voices reaching back to a summer afternoon I stopped for eggs. I knocked repeatedly. Kids said, Mom and Dad are inside. 
I was naively insistent, thinking of the supper waiting my attention down the hill. My neighbor answers the door, buttoning his shirt. Unlock the screen. I suddenly understood, felt ashamed for the intrusion. The children, unconcerned on the tire swing, pushed each other to and fro, echoing the rhythms of life. next one is in that general area and this is a neighborhood story presumably true it's called unmarked after Danish immigrant parents died she lived her entire unmarried life on the family farm cared for her single brother brother tilled the family land until called to heavenly account sister stayed alone mining the homestead till she passed their sisters married local boys, raised families nearby. Nieces and nephews inherited the family farm. None of them wanted to live in the charming old house without plumbing and electricity. Kept the place intact to protect the family secret. The old maid and bachelor brother made a baby, stillborn. Buried her by the old house in an unmarked grave. Buildings donated to museum on condition nothing disturbed the little grave site. House, machine shed moved, rest bulldozed. Trees left, left as a shrine to this lost soul. The, the poem that became the title poem of the book was called Hard Times, and it also has to do with one of these houses. It's actually the house on the cover. Abandoned houses dotted the countryside, marking failed farms, homesteaded four or five to a section, lost to banks, get big or get out. And that was, that was kind of a theme in the 1980s, that kind of get big or get out. One of the last bulldozers sat in a wildflower filled rolling meadow facing the morning sun a spring-fed stream meandered in the valley between the hills. The old house invited exploration, doors swollen open from decades of weather, broken baby crib, toy fragments scattered around abandoned home. Neighborhood lore posited that a family of squatters lived there in the 70s, kept themselves warm in the brick-lined basement, heated by an ancient wood range still holding court rotting cob pile nearby. Afternoon light shone through rafters, showcased good bones of this old structure. She must have been somebody's pride and joy. I'm changing tones just a little bit. Um, I have a, a short one about um, winter. I don't know if anybody remembers uh, five or six, seven years ago, um, there was this horrible winter around here. We had, it started snowing in November and it snowed and it snowed and it snowed. Uh, 20 foot drifts, nobody could move. Um, it lasted until April. So this is called the crossing. The horses huddle south of the barn this late February day during yet another snow hoping more hay will magically appear. Walking over a drift that covered the fence, they create a crossing into the grove, remembering summer grass. The seven stroll over this barrier daily or more often in search of food. I watch them cross with trepidation, wondering if one, then another, will be caught in the wires as snow begins to slip slide away into spring. A new one, um, sort of the cattle theme going here, so I thought I would try this. this. The pasture fence is bulletproof, aka escape proof. Built with REA pole size post and five strands of tightly stretched barbed wire. The 
when I topped the last hill on the ro road home near dusk on the first draw, 35 degree, late October day, 40 mile an hour wind howling. I see cattle spread across the road like ants pouring from a nest in a quest for food. They are in the neighbor's just harvested bean field. A half mile away in another neighbor's half picked corn and in my mostly empty garden. In the five minutes it takes to change into running shoes, warm clothes, and make phone calls for help, the cows split into a group moving away, further into the corn, like escapees putting distance between themselves and prison. Another bunch mills around the garden and yard like prison trustees, hoping they won't be blamed for the jailbreak. The sheepdog is no help, just wants to play frisbee. A half dozen thirsty animals willingly re return to the corral. Others circle around me as I try to wrangle escapees. My son diagnoses the break-in via phone. The fence held, but one of the gates gave way to cows crowding in a corner. Partners arrive just in time to fix the escape hole. Herd follows their pickup home across the bean field with typical cow lack of remorse. <laughs> I'm going to um, read from the uh, my poems from the anthology, and this is uh, a more uh, community stories, kind of with a, a mental health balance, um, focus or emphasis. Um, this one's called Pickers Decay. Fred's mom filled their home with auction finds until only paths remained through the rooms. Three older siblings married young and left town. Fred took on the job of saving stuff when his mom died, buying houses and shops to fill with old furniture, books, and bottles found scouring others' trash. He never sold anything, fearful of being cheated. Twenty-some years later, roofs are collapsing, wildlife has invaded, and places are beyond repair. After years of unheeded warnings to clean up, the village board condemned his buildings, gave Fred a timeline to fix things. The ultimatum hit Fred like a freight train he didn't hear coming. His long-term, long-suffering girlfriend offered Fred's nearly collapsed hotel free to the museum. But it was unclear if she had power to make the offer, and the museum was uncertain if it would take on the obligation. There were bids to buy the old inn 20 years ago when it could have been easily renovated. Now demolition costs run in the thousands or more to restore, rather like Fred's mental health that could have been easily treated then, but will take a long-term effort now. The next one is sort of a companion piece to that one. It's called Hotel Breakdown. Museum supporters gathered to consider the fate of Fred's deteriorating hotel next door, offered to the group last meeting, and hear the story of Fred's worsening state of mind, village concern for his father's health and move to a nursing home, Fred's suicidal threats, rumors of threats towards others, his mental health swings, county sheriff's arrival at their large, uncluttered house, where Fred fell apart after the village council condemned all his properties. Stuffed full of the town's discarded bits of broken furniture, tin cans, old bottles, rotting newspapers, collected before garbage pickup. Leftovers from auctions, boxes of plastic bags, and unidentifiable items became where he stowed them sometime in the past 20 years because he might need just that item someday. Fred was driven out of town under emergency protective custody in a patrol car. <laughs> While he's away, his sister and girlfriend, with power of attorney, have cleaned out and sold buildings. All hope he stays gone long enough for the changes to go through the final legal stages. And I'll, I'll close my part with, with this one.
called Throwaway Lives. Uh, to give you a little uh, background on Throwaway Lives, um, if you're familiar with Highway 35 leading into Norfolk, there's a turnoff on Benjamin Avenue uh, that heads towards the Northeast Community College. And so the whole piece of land that um, from Highway 35 over to the intersection um, was all part of the original regional center land. And um, it's since um, in more recent years, they've added the lineman school program in there with all the pole climbing stuff. And then the most recent addition has been the, the big uh, ag building um, next to the highway. Um, and so tucked in there in the corner is the cemetery. This is called Throwaway Lives. 842 souls buried in wooden boxes without ceremony on insane asylum land, sometimes with numbered headstones, others just buried. Tiny markers gradually sank into graves in a graveyard no one tended. New coffins added as more died in that hellhole. Families relieved of the burden of funerals for wife, daughter, husband, son, grandparent, never mentioned in polite society. A half dozen markers remain in this tiny graveyard, surviving old days and in institutional life when folks could be locked away because they were poor, homeless, disabled, mentally ill, rejected by society. People spent their lives in institutional buildings subjected to cruelty or kindness of guards, abandoned by family and society, died there in anonymity, unidentified bones never resting with their ancestors. State sold the sacred land for a song Gentlemen's agreement from one institutional leader to another. New owners promised to preserve this historic graveyard. Built the ag complex and a parking lot around old cemetery grounds. Now home to tractor shows, plant sales, cattle breeding demonstrations. Odd guardians of old graves. <laughs> Marshall Brummels, everybody. Thank you very much. How's everybody doing? Hang in there. You notice we have brand new windows in here. It's beautiful looking. We can't open them though, so it gets a little warm in here. So let's try to stay cool. And the couch looks like it's eating this, these guys over here. Are you doing okay? okay. Um, so we're gonna do the rest of the contributors here. Um, I just have a few things. So I'm gonna go, we're gonna go down through the, the list. Uh, I think it's alphabetical. Um, and uh, we did a reading, was it a week ago, down in Omaha, and same thing. It went a bit faster than what I thought, so I was trying to see whether we'd take a little break in the middle here. We'll have to kind of see if it starts going pretty fast and we'll just keep going. I know uh, two o'clock's coming up and some of you may have classes. Just. Uh, if somebody's up here, just be polite and just wait till we transition before you move. Uh, just so that poor somebody's up here reading and half the crowd leaves for class. I just don't want them, their poor soul to die. So, um, so uh, I helped uh, kind of do the layout of this, uh, the flat water stirs. Um, it was great. I got to read all these poems. I'm, I'm excited about it. But I wanted uh, um, to have. Like I said, Stephanie Marcellus is in here, um, but we have Stephanie Hempel. She was one of the editors. Um, and she's gonna come up here and she's gonna talk a little bit about uh, how it came to be. We'll just kinda give you a little background and then we'll start in on the reading, okay? Wanna come up, Stephanie? this this morning so it's a bit rough so bear with me um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about our origin um, of this project it actually started on this couch um, so it's great that it's coming full circle today 
Um, Dr. Marcellus and I were just um, talking about the Plains Writers series, which we adore. I think it's one of the greatest things that our, our institution holds. Um, and we were talking about what it means to be a Nebraska writer. Um, and most of the people that we do bring in, you know, they're published, um, they've been around a while, you know, and through different venues. Um, but we were thinking about what it means, you know, in terms of um, redefining that. We kind of wanted to open up a space for those who just haven't been published yet, or, you know, just have um, something a little different to say. Um, we wanted we wanted to have a, a place for them as well to be published to have their own space um, and so we decided to create this anthology um, and it was kind of just a dream you know uh, we ran into Chad's office one day and we said please and he was like okay um, and it turned out a lot better than we expected you know um, we've been able to hold readings um, and give the contributors an opportunity to share their work as well, which has been tremendously rewarding to watch. Um, so I'm very thankful for all of the editors um, from our last project um, and the editors of our new project. We're actually now putting out an anthology of fiction. So if you are a fiction writer, um, I believe there are some posters on the back table um, that give you a little bit of background about how to submit. Anybody can submit, we're totally open. Um, so if you, if you are interested in that, um, just pick up a poster or reach out on our Facebook page. Um, and that's all I have, so thank you guys so much. Thank you, Stephanie, that was wonderful. Um, so I'm, I'm trying to mess with this PA uh, a little bit more. Uh, you might have to adjust the mic too. I may uh, adjust it while you're up here. Um, I think uh, I wanted to let you know that, uh, so if you didn't, there should be a few more of these. If you didn't get one, they're floating back there uh, on the great wall there, if you need it. So the bios are in here of all the contrib contributors that are reading today. Um, I'm not going to be reading all your bios. You can read them in here. I'll just introduce it. Um, when you come up to read, if you want to talk a little bit uh, about yourself, intro before you read the poem, that's fine. Anything from your bio. But then have you read from the, the book. And I'm going to bring a book up here so you have one. Um, so, uh, without further ado, should we get started on this? Are we ready? Okay. Um, first up, we have Bahani Anderson. Come on up and share your poetry. I liked it better when the windows opened, too. <laughs> it would be uh, kind of hard to stay awake. Uh, oops. I don't have the book. <laughs> anyway, this first poem that I'm going to read is an old poem. Uh, and Gilbert Vaughn, who's sitting in the front row there, who was my one of my professors here uh, decades ago when I got a degree from Wayne State, uh, and he is very familiar with Ezra the Goat. Uh, <laughs> A little background, when we first moved to Nebraska 47, 48 years ago, after I had moved all over the world every three years, and now Nebraska is definitely my home, but when we first moved here, we lived in the country, uh, in an old parsonage. Am I not talking? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> we lived in an old parsonage about seven miles from Wayne. And there was a graveyard on one side of us, a one-room schoolhouse, and church. Uh, and we had one car, and winters were very, very bad back then. Uh, like, we went into a ditch the year that, uh, well, one of the years that we had Ezra the goat. But when we got Ezra, we got his brother, uh, I don't know if they were twins, but they were brothers. And Max uh, was a very mean goat. And so he would always try to gore Ezra. And we decided, Max, your time is up. And we sold him. He was slaughtered. Gilbert got half of Max. The other half we gave, actually we sold, to a, a Sikh family here in town from India. 
um, and he ended up in the pot, two different pots. Um, anyway, Gilbert was making a big curry, a goat curry dish for Sarah's birthday, my husband's birthday. And Sarah was also a Capricorn, so there are all kinds of tie-ins here. Uh, that day, we had a horrendous blizzard. We went in the ditch, and the others were all eating the goat. Uh, and the next day, we got a ride from a farmer about a mile from the parsonage. Uh, and, and our daughter, who was very young at the time, she got to stay in the house without electricity or heat, of course, uh, all night long by herself. No goat either. She said she wasn't going to eat the goat anyway, so that, that turned out fine. She was kind of a pet. Uh, so, here we go. Ezra the goat. A five-month tether, rank stubborn immobility, no usual cringing from the ruthless weather. Cloven hooves a rancid yellow, curling under soft ragged edges, hay bulging belly, winter bloat, restrictions mark about the throat. Flashing horizontal slits pierce the night's coal black wedges, tear ingrown toenail of the mind, bleeding at its rotten edges. The healing begins with a certain prancing in the spring, a partial shedding of coarse white hair, a pan-like laugh in Ezra's stare. And this one's really about the weather. Um, I didn't start gardening until we came to Nebraska. Um, and when I was a child, you know the, the hymn, uh, Sleep in Heavenly Peace? Well, I heard heavenly peas. And so I had this image of heaven being all green and mushy and stuff. So this is sort of a nod to that. Uh, wake in heavenly peas. Um, and like most of my poems, it's about life and death and survival and all that stuff. Early morning dew drenches the small plot of snow peas. Their leaves turn eagerly, innocently toward the light, forgetting the infernal heat in league with the wind, scorching them so, rec so recently. Their only defense a passive curling up, seared crinkly edges of pale green rubbery pods that self-same sun has turned a blessed leaf. Its luminous rays shine through these crisp and verdant pods in a focused lateral move of clear light compassion, embracing a network of possibilities in the beautiful tangle of their life-giving vines, which I carefully part, seeking more fruits. Like others in life, these are well hidden wedged in muddy earth after a violent storm, or simply lost in dense foliage, a jungle of doubts to cut through once again, to taste the crisp green flesh suspended from fragile tendrils of hope, seeking sun, air, and water on this amazing morning in June. So we had winter, summer, scorching summer, uh, and the last one also about the weather um, and winter. The orchard plum trees are dark skeletons cast in brittle glass, prisoners of a borrowed radiance as their icy casings reflect the sun. When the wind slaps at them, they cry faintly in oriental chimes. Then a snapping echoes through the taut air as the slender branches crack and their crystal bones shatter on the earth, boggy with layers of mulch, and as beautiful, as ugly as the eye perceives. An inner stirring urges sap to rise and waken the trees to pain, then slow healing. Spring sun, spring rain brings blossoms and come August luscious purple fruits, the most succulent nearest the stars. And I was really happy in reading through this book to see so many 
poems about trees. People really have a thing for trees. Thank you. Just in my guiding reader, if you need help, I'll come up and stumble with you. Um, all right, next up is Tana Bowie. Are you here? Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. It's a good thing they're leaving, these are depressing. <laughs> <laughs> It's called Bastards in the Snow. They walked, leaving footprints in the white dusted pavement down Main Street towards a home he hadn't seen in years. Bundled up in wool coats and cashmere scarves, naked callous fingers entwined within each other. A spectacle passed in every shop window. The glow of lights cast prejudice from predatory eyes. He was prey in a danger of vernacular ignorance bred in cages. He spoke excitedly of how he missed his mother's pretty pudding, how the elaborate trees illuminated the long family driveway, bright bows and the dark shadows of the rural outskirts. His father's belt, how it had felt on nine-year-old skin after kissing his classmate's cheek while making angels in the snow. It had been the first time he'd ever mentioned this, doubt curved with a reassuring squeeze, a swan song to goodwill toward men. The ringing in his ears and the holiday music had long since faded. He stared blankly, the twinkle of lights blending against a midnight backdrop. He felt the first, heard the second, both aimed at his heart. Lungs labored against the strain of invisible hands around his throat, blood-stained lips formed around a single name. In those final moments, clenching his lover's cold hand for the last time, remembering the broad grin, mischievous defiance, against small town simple-minded judgment. They were angels left to die in the silent night, gunned down in the shadows for what they were, bastards in the snow. My next poem is called Forsaken. Her, her face mirrored the angel in the stained glass window of the cathedral across the street. Etched deep in the pain, the contours of battle-scar bruises behind beautiful colors keeps the hell inside hidden from view. Another drunken crusade, raise of fists, crack of knuckles bloody. She weeps at his feet, baptizes the unholy ground. He stands as she shines the devil's boots with flesh and tears, wondering, where the fuck are you, God? is called, I put the gun in my mouth to remind myself I'm not ready to die. I told myself I was ready, tongue pressed underneath cold steel, but I was taken back by the sulfuric taste of two-week-old gunshot residue. It was family Christmas when we all took turns, shooting pot cans off the hillside, blowing up rotting fence posts with my brother's leftover tannerite. I think about that moment, how I'd like to do it again sometime. Thank you. Thank you, Tana. Um, quick announcement in between. Uh, we do have a contributor's copy, so if, you, uh, if you're here to read, um, you were in the book. We have a, a book back there we'd like you all. We've been having everybody sign it from the last two readings we did in Norfolk and Omaha of everybody that's in the book, so make sure you sign up before you leave today. Uh, up next, the one and only, Sharon Cole. Alright, this 
first one's called Panoramic Panties. Stevie and I take our seats in the clinic, mine a sterile gray with limited hand rests and plastic cushioning, hers a padded car seat planted on the floor in front of me, giving her a view of the rest of the waiting room. Four ounces in her belly, she's content here. Plastic binky pulsing in tiny mouth, her calmness a small miracle in the world of a newborn. I let my body relax just a little in lieu of this, preparing myself for the shit storm to ensue when she gets heavily fondled in the doctor's office. I scan our environment, looking for the familiar magazine rack full of outdated issues of Women's World and US Weekly, something to numb my mind, when I realize we are not alone here. Across the room sits a family of six, one sleepy newborn, three squirming toddlers sucking on free dum-dums from the receptionist, a preteen with her face buried in the blue glow of a tablet screen, and who I assume to be the mother of this herd. Mom's rounded and squishy looking, understandably so. Birthing five humans in a lifetime has to leave you with a heavy amount of bodily baggage and a lack of self selfishness to do anything about it. She's got a Perkins uniform on and a name tag calling her Edna. Although she's seen, or although she's at least good a good 12 feet away, a smell comprised of baby wipes, pancake syrup, and microwavable pig skins emanates from her. I internally thank Jesus' titties I'm not in her shoes. I look down at my baby, her eyes wide. She's scanning this new territory, pausing suddenly. Furrowed brows trying to focus her stare, the pacifier in her mouth grows still. I look up curious as to what has stopped her amid suck. The mother's now on her hands and knees, backside to us, her front half attempting to apprehend one of the toddlers, who has successfully, successfully tucked himself under a waiting room seat, jamming a penny up his left nostril. <laughs> this isn't what keeps our attention, though, no. What has us enthralled is the mother's ass, dead center in our range of view, specifically the underwear hanging out of her sagging dress pants. <laughs> A true work of happenstance universal art, her panoramic panties spread across her backside with a beauty comparable to the great Renaissance paintings of the old world. A floral arrangement unlike any other I've ever seen. Wildflowers and prairie grass of every kind spread in perfect patterns across the silky material, echoing the Fibonacci sequence. A golden ratio art masters spend lifetimes trying to obtain, perfected on this woman's underdrawers unbeknownst to her. Soft fuchsias and teals, bold crimson and ochre, the color within the scene so luridly vivid, so deep and full of understated feeling, Rothko would be jealous. <laughs> Flurried impressionistic brushstrokes, similar to those of Renoir or Monet, fused with intense, sporadic, genuine emotion, like that found in Monk's Scream or Van Gogh's Starry Night permeate the background. Subtle yet ferocious sexuality exudes from the flower petals in a way that would make Georgia O'Keeffe blush. I gasp as my eyes move upward, glimpsing the crowning jewel of this masterpiece. The mother's ass crack peeking out of the top of the panties, forming a crevice so deep and so wide the Grand Canyon would appear dwarfed in comparison. <laughs> a feeling of patriotism overcomes me. <laughs> God bless the American condition for creating such a brilliant work of art. I shed a single tear in admiration. Stevie's binky falls from her mouth and she projectile spits up all over her SpongeBob onesie. We both sit motionless for a minute, trying to absorb what we've just seen as the mother pulls herself and the toddler from off the floor, having successfully saved Abraham Lincoln from becoming a temporary part of her son's anatomy. The priceless artwork slips back underneath mom's work shirt, her majestic underdrawers becoming shrouded in the darkness of cheap polyester. I imagine her panties will only be seen again by an unworthy audience within the walls of a four by four foot trailer park bathroom, strewn across a hot pink floor mat, neglected, treaded on, up until the day the family's pit bull excitedly comes across the art carcass and the beauty of those panoramic panties is forever lost within the pit of Fido's stomach. <laughs> right, this one's called Honeybees. You wasted five bucks on ash-colored cotton candy in a bar older than everyone in it. 
A painted mural of the countryside lays flat and brown and green on the far wall overlooking greasy tables. Undimensional and bored, muted by the lack of substan substantial light in the place, the mural coughs a smoker's cough and stares at your short shorts. Fried food and gasoline stench infest pores in your clothes, intending to stay with you for the rest of the day. And you haven't even been in the place for more than three minutes. You flipped off the drunk girl eating the free popcorn out of a plastic dog food bowl, sitting in her habitual shining barside throne. She always looked at you like you needed a damn shower or a lobotomy or something. You remembered the days on the playground when she used to call you fat and weird. The sat satisfaction of seeing her the way she was now sat firmly in your cheeks as you grinned on your way out. You sucked that sugar down and in and out and in again, biking towards battered dirt roads and dying autumn hills, past Midwest little town America, past the water towers, stark white and looming over everything, alien, like a spaceship trying to beam you in, you kept going, past the plastic pools, sprinkler systems, with their screaming, or with screaming sticky children circling them, paying homage to the almighty water gods with sacrifices of incredibly pissed off house cats, fathers grilling dead things and mothers smelling of dish soap and bitterness, you traversed into the heart of another humid summer, the post office and the gas station and the cemetery, all empty with dust stained eyes that stare back at your skinny legs in ordered cycle, flowing with the way the sun hits the corn stalks at 3 p.m., sliding down between the rows, You'd slide down like that too sometimes, into places, into people. You're okay most of the time. You're no different from this burnt out lonely land, trying to find some place to belong to. Wear your brittle nails out, trying to get absorbed, you keep biking further out. Into a wasted comfort. Into a dirty breeze whipping sweaty strands of hair and salt past your eyelashes, down your neck. The whole of your body purges itself of sin through sweat. Those things you said to him the other day, the way his backbone gets stuck, in gets stuck in between your teeth, your hip bones, endlessly geometric dividing. These thoughts, you burn them out physically. It's the only way to bury them. Push farther on and the burn gets brighter. The big blue and empty sits open, surrounding everything, in a shining cocoon of perpetual sky. You look up into her and get lost in her dizzy motion. You inhale and she exhales for you as if she can't stand letting you breathe in too much of her. You make it to the top of the windy hill and stop nearby where the cows and the grain bins converse about the weather. From here, you can see everything. You can see the world passing over. The abandoned house sitting next to you can see this too. It lets out a heavy sigh to let you know, hey, I'm here too. Its ghostly form expanding from relentless heavy sunbeams radiating into moldy wood stained memories. Its existence cancerous. You walk up to the crooked porch and take a peek at the home's innards through a rusted out screen door. 10,000 honeybees stare back at you from the ceiling, each one with five eyes. What's left of a ceiling fan is covered in comb, dripping with honey. 50,000 eyes focused in on you. They wait motionless for you to make a move. Jay Collier can't be here today, so we're gonna move on. Um, maybe we'll do one more and then we'll take just a short break around two o'clock. Uh, just uh, that way we can get to the cookies, the Sigma cookies. You, got, you still got some back there? Okay, so we'll do one more here. We'll take just a brief five minute break and then we'll start back up with the, the other side. Up uh, is Drew uh, DeCamp. Okay, um, my first poem is called Oracle. As there are always three, so they were three in number, stooped cross-legged under tepid torchlight, a hunched obscurity. The moment attained, one inclines to recite the incantations that frame the space in which a question dangles, sagging down like an animal ensconced in the net of the sudden cast of oracular bones. Every moment is a threshold to paths of possibility, lit like shards of mica reflecting the rays of the sun at dawn, 
stretched out infinitely like the slow fingers of a lingering farewell, until they come to meet where they originated and cease to be. They will not return, not through any struggle or sorrow. Retrace your steps and find only a somber land, the place we are rack and ruin. Okay. So this next poem I entitled Cenotaph, originally, that's an editorial error. I feel like I failed my first poetry teacher, Dr. Emil at UNL, who taught me the importance of editing poetry and what to think about when you're doing it and what it could do for your work. But <laughs> So it'll be changed at some point if I ever republish it. Um, too long have we labored under death's red ensign, we happy few here symbolically interred. Our bones commingle in a skeletal clacking that looks like the morse code of a dust-blown soliloquy as we converse as one of the gravity of our deeds and what it won. Our epitaph memorializes a time when we were flesh and blood miracles of locomotion animated by life's vitality to maim and unmake those who threatened our fatherland. Now it all seems so fatuous and malign to praise us, we who were, did as we were told to do. Thank you. Thank you, Drew. All right, again, we're just gonna take a brief five minute. Check out the books, check out the goodies. Um, we'll be back here in five minutes, okay? So please, don't go anywhere.
Just a reminder, we have Poetry Slam uh, 38 tonight. Uh, starts at 7 o'clock. If you want to read, you need to be there around six, five dollars for poems if you want to participate. Um, the other thing is, uh, any, any of the stuff, uh, check out Plains Writer Series or WSC Slams or uh, WSC Press. We're all on Facebook. You can usually find links at WSCPress.com. You can get a link there. So you can Thinking about upcoming events you can find there, uh, photos of past events. Um, and just uh, speaking of future events, we do have December 7th will be our next Plains Writers. Um, it's usually fiction, 
We will have a Lucky Fiction Slam that night at 7 o'clock, the Lucky 13 Fiction Slam. Uh, during the day, um, we have a reading at 2 o'clock. Uh, for more information, check out uh, WSFS.com. How are we doing? Is everybody uh, ready? Baby's ready. Um, okay. Oh, just one more thing. At the end, again, sign if you're a contributor, please make sure you send that book back there. And I think we're going to do who's ever here left over at the end, uh, a group photo. And we did that at the other two events. So if you're still here, we'll take a group photo up here. And don't forget to buy books back there. Oh, right. So we're on the back page now. Uh, first up, we have uh, the notorious David Z. Is he here? Yeah. David Reed said, It's called Always Keep an Eye Inside Near. I learned how to drive on this highway, a weaving, unkept mess of rope keel and deer riddled ditches. My father believed in crash courses, so I clenched the wheel of his 92 Cadillac as hard as he pinched the cigarette in his stubbled lips. He never panicked. He hung one arm out the passenger window and filled the ashtray. He lit each cigarette with the butt of the last, dragged patients through a cotton filter. Sometimes he'd lean across to check the speedometer. There's a reason they call it a limit, Zachary. Each lesson more scolding and blunt than the last. I'd ease up on the gas, wait for him to complain about the old people passing us. We hit a possum about a mile from here. Patches of fur peppered for miles, my own stamp firmly pressed into the pavement. I was upset as I scrubbed the blood from the bumper in the next town. My father frowned. He didn't understand. He didn't ask, but he didn't needle it either. He paid for the gas, pulled a lighter from his shirt pocket, and tossed me the keys. On the way home, I almost ran over a man in a one-street town with the type of bar that's crowded at three on a Saturday afternoon. He stumbled into the street, but with the swift push of my father's left hand, we slid to an awkward halt at the curb. He didn't even drop his cigarette, just slammed the horn till the man slipped on the ice. He laughed, <laughs> he laughed, and said not to tell my mother. I laughed with him and forgot about the possum. He turned off the talk radio, lit another cigarette, hung his arm back out the window. He stared out, let his eyes lull to the ripple of barbed wire fences at 50 miles an hour. I took my eyes off the road, breaking a rule, caught his proud grin in the glare of the passenger side mirror. I stored it there. A decade later, I mute the talk radio, reached the dashboard, and turned the knob from defrost to the figure with the three accusing white arrows. I think of the possum, stretched out for miles, worn into the asphalt. I think of the day I crashed the caddy, of everything disintegrating between yellow lines. I peek into the passenger side mirror. I think I can make out a little of my father. All right, this one's called The Feeling. Chad and I were talking earlier about how poets always get our animals in the work. <laughs> this, one's, this one's got the Jack Russell in it. <laughs> I know now, it's not wax tabs and mushroom caps. It's not reggae music, beat zen prophecy, political rants over joints and half handles of watered down whiskey. Today, I find it under a flaring Jack Russell snout, bobbing in and out of the winter flattened Nebraska prairie grass. I find it somewhere in the Bermuda Triangle 
of a rusted muffler, a mossy, deflated football, and the feathery bones of a premature robin. I inhabit gratitude's firm grip. I exist to decipher and harmonize the cackles of assorted birds, the purring strumline of locust breeding, fleeing to another cattail and breeding again. I exist to unname them, unburden and redefine by the presence of their sound. I exist to breathe menthol smoke into green stubble, draw it up through the straggling snow. It hides from words in the flurried wings of the locust, prefers to only be visited from time to time. It waits for me to trickle into the thrumming of paper wings. This last poem goes out. I spent a very large portion of my life working night shift and overnight shift at McDonald's. Um, anybody who's worked that type of job will tell you that it's the locals that keep you going at that job. Um, so this goes out to Chuck. He's a regular out there. Chuck in the Golden Arches. A pot of McDonald's coffee takes two and a half minutes to brew. I count seconds, slide the fresh tray of quarter pounders into the heating cabinet, and wave the grill guy back in from his smoke break. I grab two rolls of each size cold cup from dry stock on my way back to the front counter. Chuck's waving, pocket change in hand. Senior coffee in the Omaha World Herald. At 53 cents a cup, it's cheaper to read his paper in a booth between order calls, slamming drive through windows, and gurgling fryers. He guides a pair of bifocals down the bridge of his nose, squints through the sports section. Royals won in extras, young, a blooper shy of a no-hitter. On the front page, there's a photo of a Syrian child, washed up, face down on a beach, under the headline, Financial Burden of Refugees. At 25, I rarely make it deeper than these pages. I believe the world is soiled as sweat drops on a grill, but Chuck knows. He knows we sweat dew into sand on chalk diamonds. And tonight, he tells me the Royals will win the series, an idea ridiculous as dead children in black and white print. I laugh, careful to tilt my breath away from the booth. I tapped the front page, spent less to help them than the Yanks did on A-Rod. Chuck frowns, tells me I should watch more baseball. I shrug, check lobby trashes on the way back to the counter. I scrub ketchup fingerprints from plastic trays, pick soggy lettuce from the grooves. I watch Chuck carefully pen lines in the microscopic stats section. I wonder how many hours of overtime it'd take to send him to a home game. I wonder if it'd ruin it for him. I wonder if the Syrian child knew he was going to die, floating in the Mediterranean alone. Maybe it was quick. Maybe he held his breath through the final inning, fought to the last pitch. Maybe Chuck knows more of these things. He knows the score of the next World Series. He told me. He told me the rest of the papers recyclable. Thank you. Thank you, David. Up next we have. <laughs> up next we have uh, Sean Donner. You here, Sean? Come on up. sweet, so let's go for it. <laughs> the title of the piece is called I Saw a Flyer Today. It read, missing, 20-year-old asshole, brown hair, 5'11", hazel eyes, medium build. If found, call this number. I dialed the number my mother picked up. Where have you been? <laughs> Dinner is ready. Sorry, Mom. I was too busy finding myself. <laughs> 
you're gonna remember later, so this is where this poem comes from. I want you to remember me like how I will remember the scar on your left arm. It's for an eternity. Day we met is when you said you got in a motorcycle accident, but I didn't believe it for a second. You didn't convince me of that long-winded tale because I know scars like that don't happen from a three-foot fall. Just like a couple like us doesn't happen by chance. We weren't lucky, we didn't have wealth, but we had love. Not the love defined by the deception of Hollywood, but the love that takes one bite and devours you whole. The love that brings you a bountiful harvest one year with a prolonged dry spell the next. You were my drought that brought plenty. <clears throat> I want you to remember me the way I will remember your hands. We held hands on our second date, latching on like we were chain link fence, too afraid to let go. Your hands in my hair, your hands around my neck, your hands making their way down my ribcage. Your fingernails digging into my back, scratching the surface, trying to imprint something that shouldn't be preserved. We weren't meant to last. A couple like us isn't built with a guarantee of outlasting the disasters. It's not about how we'll make it through, but when. When will it crumble onto us? When will we stop holding on? I want you to remember me like I will remember the smell of the plastic burning in the bonfire. That smell will float aloft forevermore. Beside the fire, we were a dream being chased by the embers. I didn't know it then, but that July night will burn every day for the rest of my life, playing over and over again like the soundtrack we are, made of only four songs, but I play it, back for the, I play it for the desire to go back. Those days didn't last long, but they will last me until I'm reincarnated. A couple like us doesn't deserve a lifetime. I want you to remember me like I will remember the taste of coffee still clinging to your breath. It lingers on and on like it has been from that day and every day since. And I know, and I get my own taste of, taste of it each morning when I drink my own cup of coffee. It clings onto every part of my mouth like you used to. Sometimes I catch myself running my tongue over my teeth to remember the way you taste it. Thank you. How's it going? This is okay. So, 
This is called You Only Call Me When You're Leaving. When your left foot, when you have your left foot out the door, right foot on the gas, when you're far enough away to dodge my heartbreak after you're gone. You only say you love me when you're leaving, when you're already halfway to middle of nowhere, Illinois, when you have rid yourself of all your baggage, except me, when you're far enough away to avoid the repercussion your love triggers. You never forget to shatter everything I've built without you before you're gone. I am always your last item of business on your to-do list, a check mark, a crossed out task, a quick chore at the end of the day. Okay, my next poem is called, You Wander In and Out of My Life Like a Train Hopping Hobo. And I let you, because I'm afraid my heart, my bed, my windowsill might be the only safe places for you to land. You nestle into me in the strangest places, my earlobes, my kneecaps, the creases in my skin on my knuckles, and I let you because I'm afraid how my earlobes will feel without you nestled in. You smear stains across the planes of my heart every time you leave, and I let you because I'm afraid to cleanse you from my lips, my cerebrum, my lungs, and realize what my life would look like without the mess of you there. I'm never worried you won't return. I'm worried how long I will let you. And my last poem is called I versus We, and it's mostly inspired by a really precious lady I know and um, just how lovely she is. Okay. I'm not completely sure, but I am almost positive listening to Frank Sinatra can soothe the soul. It's right up there with ice cream and shoe shopping. Regardless of how much Sinatra or ice cream you consume, it's almost impossible to revert to saying I after habitually saying we for too long. I know this lovely woman, Maxine, who lost her husband after 65 years of marriage, and she can't stop saying, we. We loved the farm. We really like eating egg salad sandwiches on Sundays. We've always read the Sunday paper on Monday morning. I don't know one thing about 65 years of marriage. I do know a thing or two about loneliness. I know it's easier to keep saying we instead of forcing myself to be alone with I. Just like it's easier to immerse myself in the noise of brokenness rather than be alone with the voice of regret whispering in my ear. I am broken. We were broken. You broke me. I know how it feels to feel like I don't exist in a room full of people until you took my hand and yours. And I know how it feels to use someone else for oxygen for so long, my lungs forget how to work on their own. Today, I bought a bookshelf. I was feeling suffocated and like I couldn't take another breath without you. I bought a bookshelf to prove to myself I could build it without you. And I could prove to myself I can put the pieces of my life back together without you. And now I have a bookshelf and nowhere to put it and nothing to fill it with. So I fill it with loneliness, brokenness, even oxygen, but never regret. Thank you, Erica. That was good. Um, got two more here. Uh, Courtney and Bob, are you here? Yes. Yeah, sure. Come on up. Hello. <laughs> so I just graduated last year, so it's good to see everyone again. 
I was one of the editors, and uh, the poem I'm going to read is Words Lost in the Night. I look at the lovely nights and the lonely night as I long for something more. I wonder if my words are being heard or if the night stifles them in silence. Either way, even if these words are never heard, the fact they were said says plenty. The night heard my voice. I look at the lovely, lo lovely lights and the lonely night as I long for something more. I long to be as steady as the stars and similarly just as true. I want my words, my voice, and my life to be worth something. You know if the stars are the only ones that know. I look at the lovely lights and the lonely night as I long for something more. I want to do something great and benevolent, but I'm not sure if my life and my words are good enough. I suppose in the end, the night may be my only judge and solace from an otherwise noisy, lonely world. Reader here is Liz Aziska. Um, as the last reader and one of the editors, I'd like to take a moment to thank everybody who contributed with this uh, wonderful anthology, um, particularly all the other editors, and um, very especially. Uh, Dr. Marcellus, even though she's not here today. Um, so if we could have another round of applause for them. Um, my first poem is No Man's Landfill. Oh, and a special thanks for Chad. today. I was driving in my old Pontiac, which is featured in the poem, and my phone was at home plugged in, and I just had a thought, and any writer knows that sometimes you just have to write it down. And so I was driving the country roads around the wing, I don't remember where, but, um, and so I had to grab a pen and write it on my forearm, because <laughs> I was just like, I can't forget this. Um, so, to all of you note takers, this is for you. Uh, there's an epigraph from T.S. Eliot. And the dead tree gives no shelter, the cricket no relief, and the dry stone no sound of water. I'm wasteful, yes, it's true. The ghost of petrol past lines the intestines of my Pontiac, chasing sunsets and F4s. I waste smiles on strangers, and tears on those who become strangers again. I waste my lungs on nicotine, words on crippled ears. The basket beside my desk is overflowing with crumpled stationery. I waste time on making a future I won't enjoy anyway. I waste ink and metal on self-expression. I'm wasteful, yes, but my soul is well fed. talking with a friend about how we show love in families and how it's different for every family and every family member. And so this is my brother. The first time my brother ever told me he loved me, his heart had been cracked open, then sterilized by Dr. Jack Daniels. He said, I love you, baby girl. I don't want you to see me like this. But baby girl wasn't a baby no more. But a young woman of 15, Watching his heart break from three steps away seemed like window shopping into my future. I saw that love hurt, and I wanted no part of it. Love smelt like vomit and garden debris. I was, it was the sound of a text message breakup, a picture of her caught with his best friend. My cousin thought he was being helpful, 
but only ended up splitting a serving of alcohol poisoning. Near a decade has gone by since then, and, I, and he said it again as we laid our grandmother to rest, completely sober, yet totally wasted. Only twice I heard the words, without heart, but I felt it every day. He gave me shelter from the weather and my demons, safety in numbers, and blood's thicker than water. After all, this time, I still buy his love with babysitting, and he mine with respect. out of the sand, a piece of sea glass, not yet rubbed smooth from the abrasive shovel of life. Green and sharp, you nip at my fingers every time I hold you. Tell me, how can I keep a weapon amongst jewels? piece of tape sticking to me after Didn't anybody notice this? Wasn't going to say anything? No. Uh, okay. All right. Um, thank you to everybody, Lynn, for reading. That was wonderful. And for the uh, flat water contributors, uh, spirits contributors, it was very good. Um, um, just a few things. we got books back there. We'd love you to have one if you don't have one. So come back there. And we need uh, contributors. Are going to be hand signaling. Uh, okay. I need you to sign that book back there if you were in the uh, if you were one of the contributors. Tonight, Poetry Slam 38 starts at 7 o'clock. Come down and join us. It'll be a fun time. Um, if you want to read, it's $5, four poems. Try to get down there at 6 o'clock. Seats go pretty quick, so you want to get down there. And Sigma Tau Delta, how are we doing on the cookie? And we got a few more back there? Oh, a lot of cupcakes. Yeah. Uh, we got lots of cupcakes, so check those out. Uh, Judas Goat, it still needs submission, send it. Flatwater Rises, an anthology of fiction, uh, emerging writers, check that out. Magic Basket will be around the slam tonight, I'm excited. You can submit to that. Our next one is December 7th. Uh, Plains Writers will be here at, at 2 p.m. And then we'll have uh, the Lucky 13 Fiction Slam that night. That's December 7th. Um, the other thing is, uh, if you were a contributor and you read today, I'd like to do a group photo up here if you want to. All right, thank you guys so much for coming. It was great. Thank you.